Good morning, church family. Uh, I'm so glad to be here with you. I uh, pray that you had a wonderful Easter Sunday. Year. Um, we had a wonderful Easter Sunday in Houston. My wife and I were still there, uh, taking care of the store. Her mom who passed away, and uh, we. Uh, I came back a little early, and uh, so uh, in, in, in partial, I caught cold, so so perfect. So God got me here today, so Amen. to uh, to do my thing. Yes, yes sir. Just to serve Him. Amen. Yes, sir. Yeah. That's all it's about. Yes. Uh, yeah. So we're gonna do some things a little different today. We are going to sing one hymn. Then brother is gonna play some hymns on on the screen for us today. So that way you want to hear me sing with a raspy voice all day. So let's all get up and start singing on page five, I'm sorry, three, five, eight. Three, five, eight. I wanted to hear this to do an Easter song with you, so three, five, eight. God sent his son. Three, five, eight. If you stand, you stand. If you sit, you can sit. Three, five, eight. Our most gracious and dear Heavenly Father, we come to you with joy in our hearts, my dear Lord, because you, we know that you arose from the dead. And we celebrating this, my dear Lord, our great joy, we have a living God. Amen. So thank you, my dear Lord, thank you. 
You are the man who has been taking care of us, my dear Lord, for many years. You are the man who has helping us, my dear Lord, so long. And you have forgiven our sins, my dear Lord. Thank you. I am one of millions who, ca who carry this gratitude to you, my dear Lord. You. Without you, we all go to, go, go to hell, my dear Lord. But we thank you because you have saved us. We are celebrating yes. the Lord Christ, a glorious resurrection, my dear Lord. Yes. We thank you for this. We thank you. And we pray, my dear Lord, that this day will be a blessing for everyone here in this place. You brought us here because it is your will, my dear Lord. And we thank you for this, that you gave us the time, the ability, the strength, and the will to come and worship you. It is great privilege for everyone that we are worshiping the true God. Amen. Thank you, my dear Lord. Thank you. You know the heart of everyone in this place. I know, I don't know, my dear Lord, the needs of them, but you know it in details. Yes. And I thank you because you have been always, my dear Lord, fulfilling our needs. Thank you. Thank you. We submit ourselves into your hands, into your Holy Spirit, my dear Lord. So our uh, service and our worship this time will be in spirit. Thank you, my dear Lord. I want to pray for Brother Allen when he speaks your word, that you would lift him up. Lord, we are waiting for your word that you would uh, fill our hearts with so we can hear it, understand it, and live by it, my dear Lord. So help us to be a acting like good Christians Amen. all our time, my dear Lord. Yes, it is my uh, only purpose in life and my only request, my dear Lord, to help me and my brothers and sisters to be a, a real Christian yes. who bring glory to the name of our Lord and the Savior. For the ones who doesn't know you, for the one in the, in the eyes of the ones who even uh, enemies to you, my dear Lord. Help us all to live for Christ. Thank you. Thank you. I pray this in the name of our Lord and Savior. Amen. 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 Epistle of Jude, verse 1 and 2. Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and a brother of James, to those who have been called, who are loved by God the Father and uh, kept by Jesus Christ. Mercy, peace, and love be yours in abundance. Amen. Well, you have to brother Allen to come speak with you. Please give me. Thank you. Oh, come on. My knees. <laughs> They're not as spry as they used to be. I gotta turn my microphone on. So you guys can unfortunately hear me better. Yeah. Well, I love the one verse that we uh, I mean the um, the hymn that we sang, Blessed Assurance. And I don't, I don't know if you noticed it, but in the middle of the second stanza, it talks about the calm assurance of that little baby. That uh, we can have calm assurance that that baby will be able to survive and live even, even in a, an unpredictable world. And it's only because of Jesus Christ that that baby that is born can do that. So that's pretty much what I'm going to be speaking today is security in this crazy time that we're living. I'm just curious, I'm having a little bit of feedback, but I think I'm okay. I'm just curious how many people, just by show of hands, watch the news on a... Okay, let's do that again. How many people watch the news on the, on the main, uh, just, just the main stream, uh, what do they call it, uh, the ABC, CBS, all that? Okay, the networks, right. How about 
watching the news on um, foreign broadcasts. Okay? We're down, we're down to one. <laughs> How about, do you ever watch on, on YouTube the news? Yes. Catch it on YouTube? That's where I get mine. How many feel really good after they watch the news? No, I don't. No, I, don't. I, don't think I, I didn't see any hands go up on that one. We're living in very, very uncertain times, aren't we? And um, I remember in 2019, I lost my job because of COVID at the very, very end. And um, I had already gotten over. The company I worked with had factories in China. It was an American company. They decided to do the, um, the profit thing. They put the factories in China to make more profit. Stopped all production here. Everything went to China. The companies in China, of course, everyone that is a large company and many medium-sized companies, they have to have communist ownership. The central committee has to own the company and has to have a representative there. That's part of the deal. They don't often talk about it, but that's the way it is. As a result, they send people over to the United States if they have a United States company in their country and they came over all the time. Unfortunately for me, one of the um, people that came over was from a facility we had near Wuhan and they were sick. Now we're learning more and more as things come out that the virus started a lot earlier than what we ever were told and not only that, but we just a document just came out of the um, out of the Pentagon, out of the DoD, that the virus was known as COVID-19 a lot earlier than the government claimed to have named it that. It was named COVID-19 in a document that was a contract to a laboratory that had facilities in the Ukraine to do virus research, and the purchase order lists COVID-19. And this was issued at the, at the, in fall of 2019. Can you believe that? So you can't believe everything you hear on TV. You can't believe what they tell you. I mean, our, our, our lives today, we're surrounded by liars, thieves, ungodly people. We're surrounded by lies all over the place. What used to be considered a godly nation has turned itself into an ungodly nation. When I was growing up in the 60s, it was a wonderful place to go up, grow up. Your parents didn't even have to worry where you were. You came home at night after, this, after the lights went on and uh, they, they never had to worry about you. I mean, I took my bike and I was everywhere. And I was no cell phone, no walkie-talkie, not even a string and two tin cans. It's just that they, it wasn't a bad time. It was a good time. People that do things like all the shootings we've had this year rarely occur. And yet people had guns all over the place. It's not the guns, it's the people. That's what commits the sin. The gun doesn't walk up to somebody and says, I think I'll pull my own trigger. It's the person that does that, right? So... It's a, it's a really bad time. And when we listen to the news, how many people feel really good about what's going on today? Let's, have, let's put hands up on that one. How many people feel stressed out about what's going on today? Yeah, that's where we are. And I've made it my, my mission to try to help Christians to not feel that. To learn how to live through this and have calm assurance like the like the song we, we sang, like to have calm assurance going through all of this, that everything is going to be okay. And it's not just going to church. It's not just lighting candles that's going to bring this. It is your relationship with Jesus Christ. Amen. And I put some principles together that sort of outline that. Um, there are three principles. I want to just start with... Um, the total control of all things, these are the basics of our, the basis for our security in this world, in what we are experiencing today. 
And these are definitely what you might call uncertain times. And there are other stronger words for it, but that's about as far as I'm going to go. Because a lot of people don't like to hear it, but that's the way it is. It's just uncertain. Everything is uncertain. Everything is up in the air. Um, I'm, I'm a great eschatology. Excuse me. <laughs> I have terrible allergies. My allergies have been really bad this year. They're just going to bring some water. It's too bad it's not a Kevorkian drink. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Mora. Ooh, it's been, it's been bad. Ever since I had the COVID, I had it in the form of the initial original pneumonia. That they were, and you had it too. It was so aggressive. I thought it was an allergy attack. I was on the road to Phoenix, had a meeting in Phoenix, and on the way back, it came on during that trip in my car. And it was so devastating, I almost passed out. It was so bad. It was just unbelievable. Came, to the, came home. Next day, we went to emergency, uh, urgent care. They, they, they looked scared. They looked really scared. The second day, I was coughing blood, lots of blood. Second day. And they put me on all kinds of stuff on IVs, and they finally knocked it out. But it was just like what they experienced in the initial wave in Wuhan. I got it from one of those guys coming over here because I was having meetings with them and even drove them in my car, <laughs> which Chris can relate to, in my car from the hotel to our office. And I was with them two times in close proximity that day. And I, I got COVID from it. It was devastating. And I haven't been normal since. I have been weak. I can't breathe. I, I almost feel like fainting. It's just, this stuff is just deadly. It's bad, and um, now I have long COVID. I, uh, I have the, uh, the uh, what I went through the stroke, it's called the stroke COVID. I caught this in uh, October of 2019, this, the yeah. initial stroke yeah, COVID. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's incredible, absolutely incredible. So anyway, my experience with COVID is a little different than most people tell you on the, on the news. But let's go into this. I have three total, I have three principles that I want you to, to get down. The first one is the total control of all things. Total control of all things. When we talk about God being in total control of all things in the scripture, we know, number one, the scripture definitely teaches this. This is not something that people have to stretch to make, make it a truth. It is written all over scripture, in many places, in many ways. In stories, it outlines the way God is in control. In actual straightforwardness in scripture, it says God is in total control. There's nothing outside of his control in all things. Well, we have three words that, um, that uh, theologians like to use, and you've heard these words before, I'm sure, in other sermons. The three words are omniscience, omnipotence, omnipotence and omnipresence. So I was raised by European parents and my first words were German. So when I, when I read omnipotence, I want to say omnipotence. <laughs> and people go, where are you from? I'm from omnipotence land. So it's omniscience, omnipotence, and omnipresence. What do these words mean? Omniscience, this is from the dictionary, is a state of knowing everything. God is described in the scripture many places as being in complete knowledge. In Psalm, for example, even before the word, there is a word on my tongue, David says, Psalm 139, Behold, O Lord, you know it all. And then in Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews writes in 413, There is no creature hidden from your sight, but all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of him with which we have to do. And that is God. And this is just two verses. I just That's just two small verses. They're, it's all over the scripture. The second principle, the second word is omnipotence. What does that mean? It means having unlimited power or authority. Unlimited power or authority. Again, it's a principle that's taught in scripture in many places. It's not something that's... Con that's contrived. 
It is clear in the scripture. Just two examples. Daniel 4.35. All the inhabitants of the earth are counted as nothing, but he does according to his will in the host of heaven and among all the inhabitants of the earth. And no one can ward off his hand or say to him, which is God, what have you done? No one can say that. He stands alone as being the person who is completely in control. A lot of people, especially if you go like to the, um, some of the churches that are the cultic churches, like Mormon churches, their theology says that Jesus and, and Satan are brothers. So they're putting them basically together as, as equals. They're not equals. No one can say to God, and Jesus was God in the form of his son. No one can say to him, what have you done? No one can question his authority. And in Luke 137, it says, and Christ is speaking here, for nothing will be impossible with God. Nothing. So he's omnipotent. He has all power in all things. And finally, we have the third word that the um, theologians use. It's omnipresence. Omnipresence. The presence of being everywhere at the same time. The presence of being everywhere and at the same time. A lot of times when you're in a Bible study or you're in churches, people will say, Lord, be in our presence. Lord, be in our midst. And of course, even in the Bible, it says where two or three are gathered in his name. I am there with you, right? That's because you're Christians, because the Spirit of God is with you, dwelling inside of you. But the truth of the matter is that the Bible paints the Lord as so huge and so big that the actual facts are that everything is in His presence all the time. Can you imagine that? He is so big that everything is in his presence. It's not like God is everywhere at once. It's like he is everything, and we just see a part of it. That's it. And in Psalm, it says, 139, just to to give you a depiction of this, David writes again, David, where can I go from your spirit, or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, or the grave, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the dawn and I dwell in the remotest part of the sea, even there your hand will lead me and your right hand will lay hold of me. He are always in the presence of God. He, Yes, he does see everything. He's not busy. You will never get a busy signal talking to the Lord. You will never do anything that God does not see. He sees everything. You have to be careful. Sometimes in the scripture, there's a little bit of a mystery because you have to understand that the scripture is written in such a way that it puts things in terms of how man can understand it because our brains and understanding and our soul is finite. We cannot understand. Explain to me, and people have been driven crazy trying to dwell into this topic, infinity, the concept of infinity, that, that if there's a universe out there that never ends. That's God. In fact, they believe now that there is an end to the universe somewhere, but if there is, then God goes beyond that. <laughs> Can you believe this? And when they talk about distances, they're talking about light years. And some of these things are so far away that they've, they've long since exploded and have detonated and have gone out of existence. And we won't see the results of that in our Hubble or our the new telescope that was put up there recently, I forget the name, the web. We won't see the results of that until thousands of years from now because of the way that, how long it takes the light to travel at the speed of light from where it happened to our telescope. I mean, it's so vast, it's unbelievable. But God is beyond that. It's unbelievable. The universe is in his presence. Now, there's another one that a lot of times people don't even mention. That's another one of these omni-words. And I added it here 
just because it makes a good point from what I'm going to do. It's called omnibenevolence. Omnibenevolence. I don't think that anybody or many people have even heard of this word, but theologians throw this around. Omnibenevolence, which is a concept that means that God is supremely good. Supremely good. In many of the world's religions today, you don't have that. You have gods that are fickle. They can be good on one hand. They can be bad when they're in a bad mood. They can be, you can be in favor. They can hate you. You know, or beware of so-and-so because he's on the rampage today. This is how it paints them in, in, their, in their scheme of things. It paints them that way. In fact, some of the gods that are painted in some of the um, false religions or the, what, what do you call a, a uh, worship of false god religion? I forget the, the term I'm trying to think of. Um, the gods themselves are painted as having basically two different or three different personalities. Some of them have different personalities. Like, for example, there's a god that came through all the way from Mesopotamia, from hundreds and thousands, I mean, thousands of years ago, not hundreds of thousands, but thousands of years ago. And all the way through, it's a woman, female god, that can change to a man. That's its character. And its symbol, guess what the symbol is? The rainbow. The eyes were rainbow colored. And it has also the ability to change other people, their sex, okay? And people don't see the, the imagery today in the, the lesbian movement and the transgender movement, but it is there. Some of them know about it, and this particular God came into the United States and began affecting us in the 60s. And you could see the change taking place. In fact, if you read some of Jonathan Kahn's material, he's a rabbinical pastor in New Jersey, had, had written The Harbinger and a number of other books. He has traced it down to the point where the lesbian and, and transgender movement and homosexual movement really got its start in, in a New, New York, I think it was New York area, at a place called the, the Stonewall Inn. And it was in June which is, you know, today they've selected this as the, um, the gay month and transgender month. And it was, it had so many coincidences about the people who were involved. There was a small riot, the police were involved, and it really started that movement rolling. But the coincidences about what happened is directly paralleled with this particular God. I mean, it's there, it's right in black and white. You have to pick up one of his books to get all the details, but I can't remember all of them. But there are entities that portray themselves as gods that are not even one personality. They can be two different, three different personalities, and they can change on you. Well, God is our God in the Bible is not that way. He's forever the same, unchanging, infinite, always good, always good. No evil can be in his presence. So it's, it's called omnibenevolence, all loving, perfectly just, and infinitely good. Psalm 100, for the Lord is good, his loving kindness is everlasting. His faithfulness to all generations. Psalm 145, 17, the Lord is righteous in all his ways and kind in all his deeds. You can put that in the bank. Well, I shouldn't use the bank. As, as an example anymore because they're about ready to go under. So the first one, the first principle is God is in total control of all things. God is in control of all things. He read Jude this morning, Jude um, verse 1. In Jude 1, 5, it says, I desire to remind you Though you know all things, once and for all, means that they've been given the truth by Jesus and the, and the apostles, that the Lord, after saving a people out of the land of Egypt, subsequently destroyed those who did not believe. Do you remember that? How when they came out of Egypt, they were Egyptians. Many of them were still Egyptians. Guess what, folks? Where are we? Are we in the kingdom of heaven? 
No, we are living smack dab in Egypt, in Babylon, in Sodom and Gomorrah. You look at what's happening, that's where we're living. Do you think that you as a human being can escape the effect of that? No, we cannot. We need the Lord to, know, to be able to do that. We have to have the Lord. Only by his power can we change in the midst of this kind of sick and perverse generation. In Hebrews it says, 1038, but my righteous one, God is speaking, but my righteous one, which is a believer, shall live by faith. And if he shrinks back, if he shrinks back, if he does not believe, my soul has no pleasure in him. What does that verse tell you about what God's idea is of faith? It's rather important. What problem did he have with his children of Israel when they came out of Egypt and they were finally at the bottom of the mount, of mountain where he met with them, Mount Sinai, and then he commissioned them to send people into the promised land to scout it out, and they came back with a report. Do you remember the result of that? Twelve spies went into the land. Joshua and Caleb were two of them. They were the only two that came back and said, it's an incredible land. Yeah, we've got problems, but with God, we can do it. Let's go. The other ten said, oh, it's incredible. They have incredible food. They brought back Grapes that were huge and all kinds of produce. But they said, oh, the Nephilim are there, the giants. And in, our, in, 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 our, in their eyes, we were like grasshoppers to them. How can we do How can we fight this? We can't fight. After they saw what God did in the ten plagues, took them through the Red Sea, destroyed Pharaoh's army, provided food for them in, you know, in the form of manna, out of heaven, bread every morning, all these things that the Lord did provided water out of a rock. All these things, and they still, 10 out of 12 decided, we can't do this. He wanted to, to basically destroy them. God did at that point, told Moses. Now, of course, God knew what he was saying. And he also knew what Moses was going to respond. But this was written in the scripture so that we know and we have it in this as a, as a record. I will start over. I'm going to destroy these people. I'll start over with you like I did with Abraham. And Moses said, what? Please don't do that. Think of your reputation. Moses was a humble man. He was a humble man. He didn't see himself as a father of a country. He wanted to just be a servant. He was a humble man. And, and of course it says that the Lord relented. I don't think that's as simple as that. I think that's what they call anthropom anthropomorphism. It's, it's said that way so that we can understand. But when you think about it, if there's a Lord above that's so powerful, he sees everything, knows everything, will he really change his mind? I don't have the answer to that. I'm not smart enough, but I don't think so. I think he sees everything that's going to happen and just makes us think that he changed his mind. But he really didn't. He just went through the motions of letting us find out that he doesn't change his mind. Or that he does, and, but, he, but it really doesn't. You know what I mean? It's like playing chess with somebody who can see into the future. You know, you think you got the checkmate going, and all of a sudden you look away for a second, you come back, and the board's changed, and he's winning. That's what you're doing. That's what you're dealing with. So second, the first principle is God is in total control. The second principle is my redemption by Jesus. I am in God's forever family. Now this, you must be listening carefully. You must understand this and if you don't please I beg of you just get this resolved in your life if you are standing on the wall in any way with your heart get this resolved I am in God's forever family because my redemption by Jesus on the cross and that is it just because of my redemption through Jesus we are not, well, other than the fact that we've been created by God in his image, and the fact that he says that we're special to him. Without that, guess what? That would not be true. Without him, that wouldn't be true. We would have nothing. 
I used to think I was something on a, on a stick when I was younger. I was um, not a Christian, but I was a very moral person. I didn't lie, cheat, and steal. I didn't smoke. I didn't drink. I didn't cuss. And I didn't go with girls that did. <laughs> and my dog didn't even do it. But I began to think pretty highly of myself. As a result, I thought I was a Christian, and I started associating with Christians in, 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 in uh, college. When I met my wife, they began, my wife's family is a wonderful family, beautiful Christian people. They do not have the gift of, um, of um, you know, telling the difference between the spirits. They don't have that gift, because they all accepted me at my word. Are you a Christian? Yeah, I am. I even made up a testimony, which I knew wasn't real. I wrote it down just to join a church. Yeah. But just because of what I did, I thought I was a Christian. Five years into the marriage, and it was obvious I wasn't a Christian. And that's the time when the Lord slammed me down so hard that I had nothing left to grasp onto, and I had to look up, and I finally understood. And it was like literally like Paul on the road where, his, where Jesus met him and he went blind. And then afterwards, scales dropped. Something like scales dropped off his eyes. Remember that? That's the way I felt that day. It was in, in, in September of 1982. And I was reading a Hal Lindsey book. I was reading Satan is Alive and Well and Living on the Planet Earth. And I was reading the Guilt Tip Trip chapter. I think it was chapter 13. And it was like all of a sudden the switch came on. And I could understand. I felt this weight come off of my shoulders like I'd never experienced before. Suddenly I understood who Jesus was and what he did on the cross and why and how I needed that so desperately. And it was just like, literally, the Lord opened my eyes and the Lord showed me and I came to the Lord only because he did that. There was no humanly possible way for me to understand it otherwise. And many people do not. They don't get it. And yet they still mouth it like I did. I was passing out chick publications at General Dynamics to people as an unsaved person. Yeah, I was going through the, through the motions, but I wasn't saved. Redemption in Jesus is the thing that is so important. If you haven't had that, if you're worried about it, if you're curious that something is not right, don't take that lightly. Deal with it. Deal with it. Pray to the Lord. Come to grips with it. Make sure that you are in the family because what's coming up very soon, that will be the key to your survival. That'll be the key to surviving what we're going to be going through. So we have redemption through his blood, forgiveness of our trespasses, only through Jesus. And it's not by our works, it's through grace, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. So it's not by good deeds, not by association to a to a church or to a club, if, you, if that's what you're betting on, you might as well join the Elks. Doesn't make any difference. It's not by comparison to other people. All the time I hear a lot of this stuff going on. Oh, but at least I'm not so-and-so. Well, guess what? Deep down inside, yeah, you pretty much are. <laughs> you know? I have realized things about me in the last number of years that I never thought I would be there Understanding that about my character. I am, I am, J. Vernon McGee used to say, if you knew the way I was really inside, you wouldn't be here sitting listening to me. And then he would follow it up with, but if I knew the way you really were, I wouldn't be talking to you. So that's just the way it is. We are human beings and we have a sin nature and that sin nature is capable of anything. Plus, we have a enemy that is extremely intelligent and it frosts my flakes to hear so many TV shows and TV preachers out there talking to, the, talking to Satan as if he's nothing. He is an extremely dangerous foe and much more intelligent and clever and crafty than any human being could ever be. When he indwells the Antichrist, which I think you will soon see. Then you're going to see exactly, well, the ones that are left here are going to see exactly 
what, what, what Satan is like. That, that entity is so crafty and so sinisterly wily. You cannot deal with him on your own. It says in the Bible that even Michael, when he was debating or fighting Satan over the body of Moses, did not even dare to call down a railing accusation, but merely said, the Lord rebuke you. Why did Michael just say that? Because Michael is not God. Michael is a servant of God, and he can only do what God wants him to do, and otherwise he needs to be humble. What was Satan's problem as an archangel? His Satan problem was he was not humble. He got prideful and thought that he could be God which is, an, I think, a universal insanity of some kind. So anyway, first you have God is in total control of all things. Secondly, redemption is only through Jesus Christ. Those two things you've got to get down. If you don't, please do. Third one has to do with how that redemption is sort of expressed. I serve only one master. Now this is the key, I think, to really being calm and assured in days like today. I serve only one master. Us Christians have a little bit of a hard time in this world because not only what Jesus said, because they hated me, they will hate you also. Not only that, but we live in two places at once. Alone. It's as if we have a foot in the kingdom of God and a foot on this earth. We have jobs, we have families, we have to go to school, we have to eat, we have physical ailments, we have family that has physical ailments, we have all kinds of issues that everyone knows what it's like to deal with, all of it. It's called the human condition, right? At the same time, when you're in Christ, when you have come to the Lord through Jesus, you have a foot planted firmly in heaven. That is what the Bible calls the promise. The promise. We have what promise to us? Eternal life. If I leave you now, I go and prepare a place for you so that when I come back, I can receive you and you can come with me. That's what he told the apostles. That's what he told them right before the, the Last Supper. That's what he told them. Did they get it yet? Not entirely. They were still fighting about who's going to be the top dog in heaven as far as they're concerned. It's, it, but you see, even if the apostles, after three years in ministry with Jesus, still fought amongst each other about who's going to be the prominent apostle and who's going to be next to Jesus in heaven, what, what, what chances do you think I have? I'm not an apostle. I, couldn't, I didn't even spend three years with Jesus in this earth. And I, kept, I would tell myself, well, if I got to spend three years, no, it wouldn't make, wouldn't make a difference. I'd still be a dummy. You know how they talk about pronouns today? My pronoun is, you know, such and such. My pronouns are hey you and come over here stupid. That's who I am. That's who I am. I'm not, I'm not a genius. I am a human faulty creature that can be easily seduced by an archangel or a angelic spirit or a dark entity that wants to, that wants to trip me up. I'm easily tripped up. We have to understand that as a bondservant to Christ, a bondservant means that you have willingly and happily put yourself under the service of another, which is Jesus in our case. And as that, you are faithful to him in all things. And you no longer think about yourself. You no longer think about what you want. You only think about what is good for the master. How can you benefit him? That's what the bondservant lifestyle means. And that's what the Bible calls us. And that's what we should be. So when we know that, we separate ourselves from worldly things that I used to cling to for worship and security. Like I told you, I think a couple of times ago, there was a thing in high school you used to be able to do. You can't do it anymore. I have them write down on a piece of paper all the things that are important to them in order and then go through in five, let's say five things. The fifth one, what's that? Oh, car. Fourth one, you know, and then you finally get to the top dog of their list. What is that? Well, always would it be something like 
all of my looks, my, my, my strength, my abilities, my intelligence, my intellect. The question is, can that final thing that you're, is so important to you, can that be taken away? And the answer always is, if it's not God and your relationship to him, if it's anything else, yeah, it can be taken away from you. Anything that is not your relationship with Christ can be taken away. Anything. Anything. Your freedom. You can lose your looks in a fire, in, a, in an accident. You can lose your health. I did. It doesn't matter because Lord, the Lord is my one thing that I have to focus on. What does it say? Christ said, the kingdom of heaven is like a man who finds a pearl, a costly pearl of great price and sells everything that he has just to buy that one thing. Kingdom of heaven is like a man finding a treasure in a field and it is so big that he buy, sells everything he has just to buy that field so he can have the treasure. It's giving up everything because you are only now in allegiance to the Lord through Christ. That's the hardest thing, I think, for a human being to do. Because as good Egyptians, as good Babylonians, as good Sodomites and Gomorrahites, as good human people on this God-forsaken earth, which is literally at this point in time controlled by our enemy, right? He's been given that privilege for a time. Pretty soon the restrainer is going to be removed and things are going to change after the tribulation. We, we, don't have, we have a problem with understanding that because we are raised to put our trust in things that we see. Commercials on TV, Madison Avenue, is all based on knowing that one flaw in human nature. They sell things based on that. They want you to buy a car. What do they do? They make it look as nice as it can, talk about, remember Ricardo Montalban? It has Corinthian leather. Remember that? You find out later on, he writes, there is no such thing as Corinthian leather. He just made it up. Sounded good. And also, if that doesn't work, then they put a beautiful, scantily clad woman next to the car. You know, and the guys are supposed to open their mouth and drool. And I want that car because I want that image. All the gals will be after me now. You know, and then they run around in their midlife crisis with their T-shirts open up to here with gold chains and hair popping out. You know, in a, in a convertible. And they think that that's going to make them a man. No, it doesn't. It won't. It, and if you attract anybody doing that, you're certainly not attracting the person that you really need. You're attracting somebody that's attracted to the wrong thing and they're going to dump you as soon as they can if they find somebody else that's better. It's worldly things that we used to cling to that we must dump. Matthew 6, 24. Jesus clearly says, I cannot, you cannot serve two masters. You cannot serve God and the world. You cannot. Either you will cling to the one and hate the other or you will love the one and, and not serve the other, but you cannot serve God and wealth. And it puts in, the, like in some uh, editions, it puts mammon. Mammon is a word that means wealth or, or goods or, or worldly riches. So for the time being, we are in two kingdoms, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of man. He was clear, Jesus was clear as to what man's kingdom should be in contrast to God's kingdom. And he said, do not think I came, listen to this, this is Jesus. This is Jesus himself. You talk to people, what is Jesus? Jesus is love. You know, Jesus is, is, is warm, you know, a, a fuzzy puppy breath. You know, that type of thing. It's, it's, it's cupids and hearts and unicorns. No. That's not all of Jesus. That's not all of Jesus. If you read the passages where Jesus talked to the Pharisees, holy mackerels, you get some of the most unbelievably hard words there. He said, do not think I came to bring peace on earth. This is Matthew 10. I did not come to bring peace on earth, but a sword. That's Jesus? That's Jesus. For I came to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother 
and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies will be the members of his household. He who loves his father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves his son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who has found his life will lose it. And he who has lost his life for my sake will find it. See, that's, that's Jesus. Now, what is he saying? He's not saying, when you go home today, pick a fight. He's not saying that. He's not saying that we automatically will take those positions and yeah, I want strife in the family. If there's no strife in the family, then you're not of Christ. Cool. That's not what he's saying. What he's saying is there are some people that put the relationships of the family so high up in their totem pole of, of things that even that is above God. And it cannot be. It cannot be. God and your relationship with him must be preeminent. Even to the, the loss of a family member that you cannot agree with anymore because they want to join the world or they're into some kind of error. You, you, you have to put God on top of that. That's what he's saying. He's saying is it's better to go into heaven having plucked out your eye if it offends you, which means it causes you to sin, and to cut off your hand if it causes you to sin. It is better to do that and go into heaven than to keep whole and end up in hell. That's what he's saying. He's not saying cut off your hand, pull out your eye. It's a metaphor. He's saying that's how important it is to make sure you're on the right side of things. That's what he's saying. So that's all he's saying about that. Um, so first is, the first one is, i got to go back and read the first one. I'm getting lost in my own sermon. I'm almost to the end here. Folks, be patient. Um, the first one is, God is in total control of everything, of all things. The second one is, my redemption is only through Jesus Christ. There is no other exception in the Bible. It's only through Jesus Christ. It goes from the beginning to the end. Once you understand, and your eyes have been opened, I went through seminary, and I could not believe but once I understood, I could see Jesus all the way from Genesis 3 and earlier, all the way to the end of Revelation. It was a theme. It was a theme. And it was consistent. And I said to myself, man cannot write these books this way. It's impossible. Only God could have done that and kept them complete and and. Uh, without error through those years, which when we found the Dead Sea Scrolls proved that they were complete and without error. So, how does that work in your day-to-day -day living? Let me just ask you this, because this is where the rubber meets the road. Your job, your school, your finances, and your relationships. We have to keep those things going. In fact, it says, for example, if some guy is sitting here and thinks, well, that leaves me off the hook for taking care of my family. I'm just going to sit in the corner, twiddle my thumbs all day, read the Bible, and serve God. He's not talking about that at all. In fact, if you read 1 Timothy 5.8, it, it clearly says about a husband and a father, if anyone does not provide for his own household, and especially those who in his family, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. That verse is in the scripture, so it can't be that. That's not what God's talking about. What God is talking about, it's through these activities that we are forced to do. Work, school, all these other things that we are first to, uh, forced to be involved in as human beings. Eating, preparing food, providing for our families. That's what perfects us. This is what the Lord uses in our lives to perfect us, to bring us closer the thing is that we're funny things. We're funny people. We do not achieve progress unless we are in difficulty. Have you ever noticed that? Unless we have pressure applied. J. Vernon McGee again said, we're like tea bags. We're not any good until we're in hot water. And that's pretty much like a, like a human being. 
He, have you ever noticed the movie stars and the rich people of the world who have everything and anything that they want, how void they seem of maturity? And they, they have character that's not very deep. And when, when real things hit the fan in their lives, they don't know how to handle it. And they, they're sort of like, sort of goofy, like the guy that owns Meta, Bill Gates, George Soros, uh, what's his name, Klaus Schwab, the head of the WEF, all those people who are filthy rich, they, they lack something. When things get tough in their lives, they don't know how to deal with it. We do because the Lord uses these things to mature us towards him. So don't look at your living here as time wasted. Nothing is wasted with God. Nothing. He uses all of it to mature us and to bring us closer to him. But I say to you again, just to wrap it up, that the kingdom of God is literally like a treasure that if you find it, once you realize what you have found, you forsake everything in order to get that and hold on to it. And it's not something that is an earthly treasure. God says literally, in Christ through Christ, do not store up your treasures on earth where moth and rust can destroy. Even gold can be destroyed and will all eventually be destroyed with fierce heat, according to Peter. But you store up your treasures where? In heaven. In heaven. So people sometimes want crowns. I, I suggest to you, I know the Bible says that we will be given crowns. But if you look in Revelation, what do the 24 elders do? First thing, take their crowns off and cast it to the throne. I don't want a crown. I honestly don't. I want Christ. It's better to live for a few moments at the doorposts of his temple, of his tent, than to live in luxury in the tents of wickedness. That's in the Bible, man. It, it's, it's, a te it's a temporary joy. Stolen bread is sweet, right? Temporarily. But after it yields the bitterness of sin, so always look towards God. I, it's hard for young people to see this. And I just, my heart dies because they are so easily led astray and so easily fooled by what is being taught in schools today and what our government officials are saying. And it is totally ungodly what they're doing. But we are not the cause of vengeance. The vengeance is mine, says the Lord. We watch him and see what he's doing. But I tell you, with everything that's going on now, the signs are getting clear. And I hear more and more of my theologians that I listen to getting under the, under, the, under the train, saying, yes, it's coming. I've never seen anything like this before in my life. I never thought it would be this fast. It's coming. Did you know in July we're going to a Fed now in the United States? Do you never? People don't know. FedNow is a central bank digital coin, CBDC. It's like, it's like Bitcoin, except it's issued by the Treasury Department, by the Fed, and it is not cash. It is all digital, and there will be no banks in between. You will have an account with the Fed. They will issue your money. If you're on Social Security, you get it from them every month. They will tell you how to spend it, if you can spend it, and if you can't spend it. They can give you prizes by making your cash, your money in your bank worth 1.2 times the what it's worth. They can give you penalties. That's coming in July. Look it up. That is the beginning of that system that was in, in Revelation that says no man will be able to buy or sell without the Antichrist system. That's the beginning of this. And it's coming so fast. People thought 2030, 2035, July, it's starting. They've already implemented it in a country in Africa. And how they did it was this. They told people, your cash will no longer be good. You have to go to the bank, turn your cash in, we're going digital. But we'll have this other cash printed in the meantime because we have problems with 
um, for forgeries and stuff like that. Well, the people went to the bank, turned all their cash in, and then they said, oh, we don't have enough printed to give out. But you're still digital. You see how they did this? They lied. They lied. But the entire country of a, of a third world nation where people use cash in their little businesses, little side road huts, they gave it up and they went digital. They got them to do it. If they can get them to do it, what do you think they can do with us? Remember what happened with COVID? Shutdowns, masks. Remember that? Stay home, stay home, stay home. You know, run for the hills, the sky is falling. If they can do that to us and, and a little country that has mostly poor people, third world country, they can easily do it here. And they're starting in July. I just wanted to tell you, I have a feeling that a lot of people didn't know. Look it up. It's called Fed Now. It's starting in July. Anyway, let's pray real quick. I'm sorry for going over, but I thought I would tell you that extra because it's happening. Lord, thank you so much. You are the God who does everything for us. You do everything for us. There is nothing that we can encounter that you haven't seen beforehand. We have to trust you in all these things. I humble myself before you, Father. I humble myself because I cannot, I cannot lift a finger to save my soul, but you have saved my soul. You're the one that has the truth. Right now we live in an age where truth has been turned upside down. What's right in the past is wrong now. What was wrong in the past is right now. And you can be persecuted if you don't follow what they are telling you to do. It's called hate speech. It's called all kinds of things. And they'll put you in jail. Father, we just trust you that you will guide us. You will always be with us. You'll give us strength and give us the faith to always trust in you as these times do get difficult. But the fact that they are difficult is a proof that your coming is near and imminent. We thank these things in Jesus' name. And we, we pray in, in Jesus' name also. And amen. amen.